हरे कृष्णा कृष्ण धर्म प्रभु एंड चिंतानी माता जी थैंक यू वेरी मच फॉर ज्वाइनिंग टूडे अगेन फॉर द मॉन्ग्स पॉडकास्ट थैंक यू फॉर हैविंग अस हाय कृष्णा थैंक यू फॉर लॉन्गेस्ट बी हियर थैंक यू वेरी मच सी टुडे आई थॉट वी कुड डिस्कस अबाउट विल बिल्ड ऑन द टॉपिक ऑफ इंडिपेंडेंट थॉटफुलनेस दैट वी हैड डिस्कस्ड देन वी कुड टॉक अबाउट द टॉपिक ऑफ गाइडेंस दैट एज डिवोटीज आर practice their spiritual life often they need guidance so how can that need for guidance be addressed so we could discuss broad that broadly today if you are okay with that yeah wonderful topic yes sure. thank you so technically speaking we can say that our whole tradition is for of uh, providing guidance so it is for we have the spiritual master and <clears throat> and chak the divya chakshu the spiritual master is supposed to give us is gives us so in that sense that is the traditional um arrangement for providing guidance now how does that translate into devotees lives in a practical sense maybe you could explore when you know, both of you had practiced bhakti for more than about four decades four five decades so maybe you could share what you have observed what you have learned and how you see things working thank you prabhu um i'll say a little something and then uh, invite chintamani to uh, add whatever she likes so your question is um you know our, our whole thing tradition is about um accepting the authority of the spiritual master um mm. and it, it, how does that translate into iskon in the current time how do we get guidance you know normally traditionally one would be guided by his guru perhaps in a village setting there would be some uh, you know the 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 family guru would be there and, and he would help and guide um but now it's an institution and it's a little different so uh, how does it work how do we see that working um mm. and uh, i i would start by saying primarily for us in iskon um we're talking about shri la prabhupad he is our primary authority um i i was just r- recently looking at um some statements from the uh, gbc and um th- they say that shila prabhupad as the founder of charya of iskon is the preeminent guru for all members of iskon all members of iskon for all generations are encouraged to seek shelter of shila prabhupad all members of iskon are entitled and encouraged to have a personal relationship with shila prabhupad through his books teaching service and his iskon society and a, a pursuant to that uh, point anutama prabhu who is the minister of communications for iskon said this that this gbc statement on prabhupad's preeminent position is part of an ongoing effort to better educate iskon devotees about shila prabhupad's unique stature and contributions Prabhupada taught us that his books would be the law books for the next 10,000 years. During that time, many spiritual leaders and gurus will come and go within his con. <coughs> Excuse me. However, Prabhupada will be the founder acharya and the preeminent instructing guru for Iskon for all times. It is not that Shri Prabhupada is meant to be a guru only for his immediate disciples. He is the preeminent spiritual authority for all iskon devotees and that will never change oh. so we very much endorse that <laughs> um and uh, for us it's just a question of how can that be implemented if prabhupad is our preeminent authority then <clears throat> how can we establish that from day one um you know how can we make that our culture that pervades and that persists um within our society um so that is that's really the thrust of our um our whole thing really in in talk in terms of uh you know the culture that we'd like to see improving sadhu sangha and our approach our whole approach to authority in iskon the gurus and everything else starts with shila prabhupad the uttama adhikari pure devotee you know <laughs> acharya and preeminent authority for all of us okay Yeah, I think that's. I don't know what you're a... Sorry. Thank you. Yeah, yes. go ahead. Yes. So, Madhav, you want to speak something? Then I'll 
ask something or how do you want to go ahead? I would be so grateful for a chance to reflect back what my husband said, because I find that sometimes it echoes when we reflect it back. So, Swami, um, in response to uh, Chaitanya Charan Prabhu's wonderful opening, which is that it is our tradition, uh, the passion of tradition, to take guidance from the Lord and his representative, how does that translate? How would we like to see that translate? into it's gone today and going forward. And and you said, well, the GBC have already already have a wonderful resolution in this regard, which we think is you know, on point in every way. Uh, according to the GBC's own resolution and the words of their own um, uh, communications director or representative, I don't know what Anutum of Prabhu's title is, um, Minister of Communications. Minister of Communication. Um, Prabhupada is uh, the preeminent of Guru, of not just his direct disciples, but of everyone who comes to ISKCON today, tomorrow, and, and for as long as ISKCON exists. And that they are encouraging everyone to take Prabhupada's direct association through his books, through his audios, and, um, and through service to him. Um, and they see the role of every other guru in Iskcon as meant to be supportive of that, that connecting us with Prabhupada's teachings. So you're saying that's our point. That's what we would love to see happen. We would love to see Prabhupada's preeminent position as the ultimate shiksha guru, the ultimate guide. The only question is how can we ensure this happens? How can we ensure people are actually getting Prabhupada's guidance, and you'd like to talk about that. How can we make sure they actually are getting his guidance? Did I understand you correctly? He did, yes. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, Chaitanya Saram Prabhu, did you want to say something? Yeah. Uh, thank you for reflecting that, Mataji, on what Shridhar Prabhu said. Uh, so, now this is, uh, and we understand that Prabhupada is the founder of Acharya, and he's the Prominent, we could say the preeminent Shiksha Guru. At the same time, this can take us very close to the idea of Prithvik where we don't need any living guide at all. At one level, it is uh, we are a tradition. You know, then we say, why stop at Prabhupada? We could go to Bhaktivana Thakur, why stop? We could stop at Jiva Goswami. We could go to Rupa Goswami. I mean, obviously, we're not going to do that. And we understand Prabhupada has a distinct position. But Prabhupada wouldn't want to ever say that I am greater than my, the previous Acharyas. So it, there is a living dimension to the tradition. And uh, are we undercutting that by saying that Prabhupada is the guru of everyone? Mm. So okay. yeah, maybe this is a different direction. I'm taking this question, but that's what given when that particular statement. We do need living guides, don't we? Uh, what are your thoughts about that? Okay, thank you, Prabhu. You're saying, um, okay, so if we emphasize Srila Prabhupada as our authority, um, then uh, what about the element of the living guide? Um, after all, there are so many great Acharyas that we could uh, go directly to. Um, why not Srila Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati or you know, um, his spiritual master or Lord Chaitanya, <laughs> the six Goswamis. Um, so um, you're saying that, that there's a, you know, a tradition of accepting an authority, a living authority in your life. So could that be undermined by this um, stress on the importance of taking shelter and direct guidance through the books of Srila Prabhupada, uh, I understand, yeah? Um, uh, and in response to that, I would say, um, uh, uh, yes, of course, uh, uh, you know, we, we, we want, um, and it, it would be wonderful if, if we're able to find someone who can actually um, help us in our spiritual life. But this raises questions for me. Uh, when does that when should we find that person? How should we find that person? What sort of guidance should that person give us? All we're saying is, uh, let that develop organically and in time. But first of all, let's you know, establish the foundation. The foundational Shiksha Guru is Srila Prabhupada. So let's form our relationship with him. Um, and then 
by you know training devotees how to use their intelligence, how to become Shastra Chakras from Srila Prabhupada, from hearing Srila Prabhupada, they in time will be able to make some kind of discernment as to who uh, can be their guide and, or who can help them and how they, that kind of help uh, is required. What, you know, what sort of help do we need? Um, you know, we have ideas about that also, you know, the, the kind of guidance that the, um, the spiritual masters, etc., in ISKCON should be giving. But before we get to that point, uh, let's first of all establish our basic relationship with Srila Prabhupada. Okay. So what, if I understand right, it's like Spirit Prabhupada is our guide so that we can find a guide also. Is that what you're saying? Yes. First of all, Srila Prabhupada, let's equip our intelligence, our discrimination, our critical faculty, um, so that we can make a choice. Because Shastra tells us that we have, to, we have to be discriminatory. We have to test. How are we going to do that? In fact, in, you know, in, in terms of Bhakti, it comes some way down the line that you make that decision. First of all, there's a Sadhu Sangha. You, you, you get your initial faith, then you Sadhu Sangha, and then Bhajana Kriya, there's another stage that comes after that. And it's in that third stage that the process of Diksha should be occurring. When you've actually developed a little bit of knowledge and understanding. You know, Srila Prabhupada used to say, um, how can you buy gold if you don't know what gold looks like? You're going to be given false gold. If you don't have any idea how to test gold, what is actually gold, someone will come to you with false gold. Oh, thank you. I'll take that. Yeah. Here's all my money. You know, and, and <laughs> next thing you know, you've been, you've been swindled, you know. So first of all, yes, as you say, let's associate with Srila Prabhupada, Sadhu Sangha, and then get later to that point. There's no immediate rush for that. Okay. And uh, if I understand right, what you're uh, saying is, um, Mother, you can also respond to this if you uh, want to. That once, uh, in one sense, right from the beginning, uh, there is uh, the onus for decision making is not outsourced to some other authority, but the onus for decision making is placed on the devotee with the wisdom that they have learned from Prabhupada. You've understood. Thank you, Prabhu. Yes. I've let my wife say something. <laughs> uh, first of all, Shaitanya Sharan Prabhu, you know, Prabhupada says um, wisdom is truth put succinctly. And I love the way that you capture the essence of what we're trying to say in such a succinct way. That, you know, it's not that we're saying no gurus, it's we're saying for Prabhupada is the preeminent guru, that the first training is to just, you know, understand his books, assimilate his books. And from that, we get the intelligence with which to um, perform our God given responsibility, which is to make correct choices and take, seek correct guidance rather than having that correct guidance pre-selected for us. I think that's the way, you know, I mean, you put it much more succinctly than me, but uh, I just wanted to thank you for that. You really did capture it. Um, if, if I was to add anything, I, I just want to add some evidences to support this. You know, it's like, at the end of the day, if we do not, there is a verse uh, that if we don't follow the Pantratric Bidi, then everything we do will simply become a... Um, trouble in society. Maybe you can help. I'm terrible with the Sanskrit verses. I remember the yeah. concepts. There is but you know the verse yeah. I'm speaking about. So if we don't follow the previous Acharyas and the, um, the statements of Shastra, then our decision-making will create problems. So let's see what our previous Acharya says. It's not just what the GBC says. On the point about you have to first become a little intelligent, Prophet says this in a lecture. Suppose you have to purchase some gold or jewels. This is an election he gave in New York in 66. He says, suppose you have to purchase some gold or jewels. If you do not know where to purchase, if you go to a grocery shop to purchase a jewel, then you'll be cheated. If you go to a grocer and ask, can you sell me a diamond? 
he will understand, here is a fool, let me send him something else for a diamond. You can charge anything. When you come home, your relatives will ask, what have you bought? This is a diamond. I bought it at the grocery store shop. Trying to find a spiritual master in that way will not do. You have to become a little intelligent because without being intelligent, no one can make any spiritual progress. Please bear with me. I'm going somewhere with this. Mm. So the GBC's current policies are kind of like thinks they're assuming because we're an international society, the traditional scriptural ways of doing things won't work. We have to come up with a new way. We will pre-select who is a guide, who is an authority. And that pre-selection is based on the presumption that the prospective disciples do not have sufficient intelligence to make that selection for themselves. Now, Scripture and Prabhupada say, no, first make them a little intelligent. Make them intelligent enough that they don't need your pre-selection process. You know, why do we do this pre as Every time uh, my husband speaks to a member who's of the view, we must make the pre-selection, they think it will be madness. People will select anybody. They will select foolishly. But that's because ISKCON is not doing its job in helping people to become a little intelligent. That's ISKCON's job. It's our duty to help people become Shastra Chakshush and independently thoughtful. And it's not just the GBC that says the way to do that is by going to Prabhupada's books. It's Prabhupada himself. In so many places, Prabhupada says, um, here, here's a lecture in um, before, uh, before 72. You, uh, before you uh, give that quote, can I, can I just make a point of clarification? Because I know this is going to be like, uh, you know, people are hearing this um, from, you know, the, the, the tears of authority. Uh, that they, they will immediately think, oh, hang on a second, that's not correct. Because you used the word select, pre-select. Um, now, um, they're, they're always at pains to point out to me that, no, we're not selecting anyone. Uh, you know, you select, we approve. Um, and we're simply doing this approval and no objection. Um, we're not, you know, so I, I want to make that distinction because um, I, that will be an objection. But I, I also just quickly will add and let you carry on because I don't want to interrupt you. I just thought I'd better make that point so that people who are listening realize that we are aware of the fact that the GBC are not actually selecting anyone. But that is the net effect of the current way things work. Because once they have approved someone, they're added to a list, they're given the title ISKCON Guru in all media, in external media, they're called ISKCON Guru. So they become a separate, distinct person who's effectively been appointed to the role of Guru. Um, so as I was saying in, in my earlier on, when people come, you know, they don't understand much at all. They, they just know, here are the Gurus. You know, so they have effectively been selected in one sense although you know how how that came about uh, initially is is another thing but um it, it's not a direct it's not like they have looked among all the devotees and said this one this one this one and this one will be gurus but that's how it kind of works you know in the eyes of the general devotees so i just wanted to add that so you're saying it's in incorrect when I say they pre-select. They don't. They say we select, they approve. Yeah. But it, it turns out in the end, in the eyes of newcomers, it looks like a pre-selected group. It looks that way, yeah. I, I, I did want to go on, on my actual train of thought, but yeah. whatever is said, Swami, um, like I know that there are hundreds of disciples waiting to take initiation from one of your god brothers, uh, Chaitanya Charanprabhu, a sannyasi. And He's qualified to be given sannyas to. He's qualified to be a, you know, an international traveling preacher. But for some reason, for some, without, it's not based on, it's for some subjective reason, they're not giving permission. So they're not giving approvals. It, they select in a very subjective way who they will give approval to. Mm. Um, so whatever is said, it doesn't work exactly the way they say. No, it's, this is, this it's, is it seems yeah. very subjective and it's like without any rhyme or reason, but certainly not a rhyme or reason which is publicly discussed, um, how they how they give their approval. But would you mind if I 
return to the actual point I was making. My actual point is that Prabhupada's the, the correct Shastric way um, to select is that to help the prospective disciple first become a little intelligent. Um, I know that I saw an interview with Deva Madhava and where um, Namras raised the point, well, if, if, if you let the disciples select, then you'll, they'll select all kinds of, you know, uh, inappropriate people, unqualified people. And Deva Madhava made such a good point, just on this point. But right now, there's so many unqualified disciples. They're unqualified because they were not capable of making their own decision. In that sense, we're unqualified. We're, we're assuming a disqualification on the part of the disciple, and we institutionalize disqualification on the part of the disciple. We, we, we ensure the disciples re, don't develop the sufficient intelligence to make this very important decision for themselves. It's not that we're saying stop guru disciples, we're just saying the first part of the induction, when someone comes with Adol Shraddha, what is the next step? The next step is Sadhu Sangha. Sadhu Sangha has no rank or hierarchy. It's sadhus. We discuss Prabhupada's books. And because there's no like, oh, you're a senior, you're the guru, therefore I can't have a different opinion to you, we're allowed to learn to think for ourselves in, the, in, the, in that um, association of sadhus who train us how to think through the eyes of scripture, to support what we're saying with scripture, to speak nicely in 1715. This is the way we should be trained. And I'm just telling you how the, the Gita says we should be trained. He okay. says, uh, the Gita says, Bhagavad Gita 1715, the process of speaking in spiritual circles is to say something upheld by the scriptures. One should at once quote from scriptural authority to back up what he is saying. At the same time, such talk should be very pleasurable to the ear. By such discussions, one may derive the highest benefit and elevate human society. So that, that sadhu sangha, that, so I was reading a quote from Prabhupada. He says, I'm therefore so much laboring hard that we, before my leaving this body, I may give you some books you can enjoy after my death. So utilize it, utilize it. Read every shloka nicely. Try to understand the meaning. Discuss amongst yourselves. Nityam Bhagavata Sevaya. That is our mission. So our humble suggestion is, let's put sadhu sangha back where it's meant to be. It's meant to be between Adoshada and uh, and um, Bajana Kriya. And initiation shouldn't take place until some way mid Bajana Kriya, when the disciple, prospective disciple is already quite intelligent and, and uh, shastrically informed and of good behavior, then initiation is suitable. Um, so if we just immediately induct people into initiation, we're inducting people in who are not suitable yet. They're not trained sufficiently. They've missed out the crucial point of sadhu sangha. Um, so that we would like to see ISKCON's okay. culture begin to, like when I joined, Kirtan wasn't a part of ISKCON's culture. It was all book distribution. Get out there and do big. That was our sole thing. Since I joined, the culture has developed and evolved. And now this kirtan is like the main, the book distribution and kirtan. Kirtan is big. But we are still leaving out a, the, the most important and fundamental part of the culture of Shravanam Kirtana, is to hear, discuss the teachings of our founder, Charya, the Gita and Bhagavatam. Chapter Canto 2, Chapter 2, Text 30 in the Purport Prophet says, when we speak about hearing and chanting, we don't just mean hearing and chanting the Hare Krishna mantra. We also mean hearing and discussing books like Bhagavad Gita and Bhagavatam. And those discussions should be done according to the principles of Vada. Prophet says in Canto 3, Chapter 3, Text 6, unless and until we're trained in the culture of good association, we cannot become good. So if we just discuss without citing Shastra at Hanuman attacks and you know, um, which, um, putting each other down, we're not going to transform. We have to be trained in the culture of good sadhu sangha, how to discuss Prabhupada's books in a pleasant way, always supporting our points with Shastra. Then we'll become a little intelligent. Then entering into a guru-disciple relationship will happen without 
the need for ISKCON legislation and will happen in a way where the, both the disciple and the guru feel actually fulfilled in their relationships. So that was a huge soundbite, but I just wanted to get my point in. <laughs> <laughs> can, I reflect, can I reflect that back, uh, Chaitanya Sarana, see if I can... Yes, perhaps, uh, what you said. Um, yeah, so you, you began by um, thank you, Prabhu. You, you, you began by uh, quoting this verse from um, uh, from Prabhupada lecture, uh, a section where he s- spoke about um, someone going to the grocery store <laughs> asking for a diamond. You know, if, if you if you want gold or diamonds, then um, you need to know where to go and, wh- and what you're looking for and how to test. So if someone walks into the grocery store and says, I'd like to buy a diamond, you know, <laughs> the man's going to say, oh, here's a fool. <laughs> Excellent. And sell him a piece of glass and charge him what he likes. So, um, you know, you're saying that um, people have to be educated. Devotees, when they come, they come with Shraddha um, and they, they, they need Sadhu Sangha in order to educate them so that they can they get that discrimination. Um, and and they don't make uh, a foolish choice, or they don't make a choice based on some flimsy criteria, some sentiment or something. And you said that you know the, the way things work at the moment in ISCON is that the GBC are effectively selecting. I, I made the point already about you know okay, literally speaking, they're not doing that. But the you know as far as everyone's concerned, they have done that. We have our list of gurus. And nine out of ten of new devotees who come into the temple uh, immediately think, oh, I just have to choose one of these existing gurus. Very rarely is it otherwise. And, and you said that, um, and as far as selection goes, you know, the, the, there are, quite, you know, devotees who, who want to become gurus who have um, disciples approaching them, potential disciples approaching them. And you gave the example of Chaitanya Trampa, who is god brother. Um, who is currently not being allowed to accept disciples uh, for no particular reason that we can understand. You know, it's his own. Two of his god brothers. One of your god brothers is the only devotee in Iskon who's got the Bhakti by Baba. Is it Bhakti by Baba the highest qualification? Bhakti Vedanta. Bhakti Vedanta. Bhakti Vedanta. Yeah. He's yeah, the he's... only one who's taken the Bhakti Vedanta. Yeah, he's got that. <laughs> and I know people who want to take initiation from him. For who knows why? The answer is no. Yeah. God knows and, why. And, and, and I mean, in, in, even in terms of etiquette, yeah. both of these devotees, their initiating spiritual masters are no longer uh, on the planet, even, you know, both mm-hmm. in yeah. both cases. Uh, well, uh, yeah. No, they're, they're, his they're, they're, godbrothers. They're, yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Anyway, um, his godbrother, yeah. So, but anyway, they're, they're, they're not, you know, for some reason or another, they're not being allowed to, 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 to do that. So, so there is an effective um, selection taking place or, or you know, um, they're, they're, they're certainly controlling it. And devotees, therefore, are being led in certain directions towards certain individuals rather than uh, having their intelligence trained, their, their shastric knowledge developed. Uh, they become shastra chakshush, and then they can uh, see for themselves um, who is qualified, who isn't, and in due course of time, make a, 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 a well-informed decision. I think that's what you were saying. Did, did I miss anything? Would you like to add anything? Yeah, I think that's the crux of it. Yeah? Okay. Okay, so... Uh, did you want to say anything, Chaitanya Charam Prabhu? Yeah, I mean, quite a lot, if you don't mind. Uh, you know, beyond the specifics of who is being allowed and not, and yes, there could be greater rationality, transparency in the process. I don't want to get into the specifics of particular individuals because we don't know what all is going on uh, in particular cases. But in terms of principle, uh, I'm not really sure that uh, the metaphor of the gold, uh, what you used, would apply in its entirety in this situation. I would like to offer another metaphor. Now, Prabhupada is talking about that we have to know something about a guru. That is true. And it's obvious that a devotee who is well educated, who has learned some philosophy, they will be learning something and moving forward. Now, you talked about the nine stages of bhakti as given Rupa Goswami. Now, if you look at the 64 elements of bhakti, same Rupa Goswami, same book, he says, Adau Guru Pada Ashrayaha. So he says the first element, Adau, that's a very clear word, Adau. So where, where earlier is the word Adau Shraddha, 
elsewhere it is adho guru pada ashraya so for the nine stages it begins with shraddha for the 64 elements it begins with guru pada ashraya and then the next is sat dharma guru pichcha that ask questions about the nature of reality from the guru so i i am not sure whether <clears throat> the scriptural evidence is as unambiguously supportive of what you are saying <clears throat> essentially but even from the from the metaphor prabhupad did create a uh, organization and he wanted that organization to be have uh, some level of coherent structure he he we could say even when he was there he organized he gave power to the governing body commission and uh, it's like a I, i'm not sure whether you made the difference between selection and uh, approval uh in in terms of devotees gaining guidance or devotees learning to get whatever they need or the guidance they need the wisdom they need inside and it for going ahead in their lives i'm not sure whether the pre selection or the pre approval of the gurus is the biggest obstacle because you have to take another example from uh, you know if we have a orphan child and they want to they have to decide whom to they are, they are interested in some adoptive parent now does the orphan child go around looking who will be my parent now they certainly have some some forum to select but generally among the adoptive parents are chosen by are the adoptive parents the list is approved by the government the child protection services or who all and then among those approved adoptive parents the child can choose one so it's a it's very rare that anybody has absolute freedom you know in the name of absolute independence or independent thoughtfulness if we go toward the domain of absolute freedom in which other domain do we actually have that you know we don't choose our gender when we are born we don't choose the nationality where we are born so by fate itself our the domain of our independence is restricted if you see in the vedic culture now we, we can't replicate vedic culture entirely uh, in the vedic culture even marriages were arranged and the people who were going to live with each other had had practically no say and that was not just vedic culture i would say it was there everywhere in the world now today people have much more say in what they decide and uh, traditionally also uh, it was not that there were a uh, 100 gurus available for people uh, and one was chosen that you know, mostly people broadly what what i understand the local priest would be there and the priest would most of the times become the guru of the people or sometimes there were traveling sanyasis the prabhu pat talks about it in the cc purport those two things and either the local priest would become the guru or some traveling sanyasis would be there they would become the guru but then they would practically not be available at all because they would they're just traveling we have the example of advaita acharya being initiated by madhavendra puri but then practically advaita acharya and madhavendra never met after that and that's why when ishwar puri came there he was very happy so my point is that uh, in the tradition also the, the now whether a particular body is pre selecting a set of teachers from whom we choose or not well if the if the body is not going to do it nature itself does it the ways of nature do it nobody has uh, in their uh, nobody in their real life has has complete independence so if and then i understand why we were why we brought up this discussion was that you're talking about the ethos of devotees learning to think and choose responsibly so uh, now that is something which is i i definitely agree with last time discussed about the independent thoughtfulness as a very important uh, aspect of a devotee's life but i am not really sure whether the whether a person has chooses a guru among a pre existing uh, panel of approved gurus and whether a person has has to choose a guru from every single devotee within his con would that really make that huge a difference in terms of devotees learning learning responsibility that is something which individuals have to learn and 
if uh, so maybe we could focus on that aspect of how devotees could be trained in independent responsibility and the issue of gurus being approved it is important gurus whether they approve approved or selected after being approved or selected without any institutional approval that's the issue in itself but maybe that could be we could discuss it separately at some other time because right now if we consider this podcast it's primarily being heard by uh, average devotees and they don't have the 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 authority to change the existing system so if we are considering what are the needs of devotees right now and how could those needs be addressed so can, uh, is it okay if we discuss that and yes. then that direct take the discussion would, in that direction would you mind if i actually understood you and and responded i know my husband is senior to me but I, I, because i felt that you were responding to something i said would you mind if i understood you and responded yes please please thank you very much so you were saying that um, the example proper gives of the grocery shops not really applicable it's gone as the jewelry jewelry shop recover and the uh, the kind of like sticking on the point of pre selection that's not necessarily helpful um you know that was going on in vedic times anyway that every village had its pre selected uh, brahman guru or the person who was recognized as a guru and even if we want to argue that point it's not helpful for devotees in general because they don't have the authority to change the way things are so why go on about something which is not within our scope of influence it's outside of our scope of influence so can we stop harping on about that and focus more on how we can how the devotees can be trained to become more personally responsible and i said it correctly yes would you mind if i made some responses to that yeah okay certainly So the reason I quoted Prabhupada's grocery shop is because the last thing he says without being intelligent no one can make any spiritual progress it's that that we have to cultivate when a when a new person comes with some adoshada the responsibility of iskon and all of iskon's preachers temple presidents and everyone else who's working for the preaching effort is to assist that newcomer to come and become a little spiritually intelligent and that is the reason why the sadhu sangha is that sadhu sangha is for that sadhu sangha is not just coming together and doing kirtan sadhu sangha is coming together and allowing the devotees to think and teaching them how to think through the eyes of scripture the only reason i wrote in the pre selection thing is is that that pre selection and really the sadhu sangha was improved i don't mind i don't feel as if i have the uh, answers to all iskon's questions i'm just saying bring that sadhu sangha in properly if that sadhu sangha is brought in properly for the disciple will even make correct choices for themselves amongst the preselected gurus if necessary it doesn't matter but just train them to become a little intelligent train them how to select um the oh, Yeah, just let's fix on that. Let's train okay. the bodies not just how to select but how to think. You know, all the decisions in our lives are not around guru. Some of the decisions in our lives are around, you know, what is the best ashram for me? You know, if I am in the grihastha ashram, how should I deal with my family? Um how should I deal at work? If I'm in the branch or renounced ashram, how should I interact? To answer any question in our life we need to be a little scripturally intelligent we need to be able to make our decisions through the eyes of scripture there isn't going to be someone sitting there next to us always telling us the right answer we need to train devotees to think for themselves through the eyes of scripture that's all we are proposing and that is the function of sadhu sangha to train mm-hmm. devotees like proper wrote a letter to tribhuvana Now I want all of my devotees to be dis- reading my books more and discussing them from different perspectives become practiced in this. Right now if we do sadhu sangha is one perspective. You're the senior devotee, I hear from you, I do what I think what you tell me to think and bus finished. No, 
Sadhu Sangha, the Sadhu Sangha is different from Guru Sangha. Sadhu Sangha means I haven't yet accepted you as Guru. I can think for myself. I can say, Chaitanya Charanpapu, that's a really interesting point, but I see it differently. And you're allowing me to learn to think for myself. Mm. And that element is missing. We go immediately from newcomer to Guru Sangha. And in Guru Sangha, there isn't room for thinking for yourself. That is just some bada. Now accept whatever you say, I accept. You say jump, I jump. You say this is a rope, I say it's a rope. But there is meant to be a process before that Sadhu Sangha where you can say this is a rope and I can say, well, it doesn't look like a rope to me. It looks like a snake. Convince me it's a rope. Let me think for myself. Help me to think. And that we need to bring that into Iskon. Just like we brought Kirtan in, we only used to have book distribution, now we have book distribution and Kirtan. Let's bring in the culture of proper discussion of Prabhupada's books, where everyone is participating and learning to think for themselves, speaking kindly and respectfully to each other, and supporting their points with Shastric statements. Not just, I think, in my opinion, because I said so. Mm. Um. I, 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 Thank you, Mataji. I wanted to um, capture, well, uh, my wife missed a few things that you said, um, which I wanted to capture, but then I think I, I should understand her as well. But I can start with you. Um, you know, you, you also uh, cited, like, because we, we've said, Ado, Shraddha, Tata, Sadhu, Sangha, etc. And you said, well, also, Rupa Goswami said, Ado, Guru, Padasraya, that you, the first thing is to accept the Guru. Um, and you know, uh, here him, uh, so Dan Pritchard, so that we should then question him. Um, and you said that, um, uh, that that you know is something which, um, it, it is uh, goes on in this con. It, it, it you don't necessarily think that that has to be a problem, even if the spiritual master is not available. Uh, you cited the example of Madhavendra Puri and Ishwara Puri. Um, and having taken initiation, Ishwarapuri took initiation and never really saw his guru again for a long time, you know, didn't really get much association. So you're saying, is that, is, does that have to be a problem? Does that have to be an impediment to what we're saying, the sadhusanga? Um, if there is these gurus and devotees come and they, they choose one and then, um, and then he's not, not in the picture, uh, they can still carry on. And that's what I think you were saying, right? They can still get Sadhu Sangha, and you know what we're suggesting can take place. Did yeah. I understand you? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Thank you. And and and, um, and, and Shantamani was really stressing the importance of, um, of, of of that element of the Sadhu Sangha element. She was saying, okay, maybe as far as the Guru situation goes, fine. You know, we don't have to get into that and talk about you know whether there should be approved Gurus or not. But what there has to be is Sadhu Sangha, uh, uh, this process of um, coming together as peers, discussing the philosophy, and um, learning how to use our intelligence, our discernment, uh, based on Shastra. Not that we come in and initially um, there's a culture where uh, we take a guru, um, and you know, then, then it's like there's no scope really for our uh, questioning, for our using our own intelligence, having our own perspectives. Like Prabhupada said, learn how to study my books and see them from different angles, different perspectives, different lights. But you're not going to be able to do that if you've already accepted a spiritual master and he's telling you his lights, his perspective. They have to become your perspective. So, you know, there isn't a lot of scope for that. Um, that I think that was what um, my wife was saying. Uh, did I understand you? Yeah? Yes. Yes. Okay. Um, and uh, I, I just want to add one thing, uh, you know, as regards, um, I totally agree with what uh, my wife's saying, of course, we, we're, we're together in this, that we're trying to implement this, this, this idea of Vada discussions, of trying to understand what is the truth, um, and, you know, using our intelligence, being taught how to think, not what to think. Um, and I just wanted to read one, one thing, if I may, because um, in terms of the... Um, the situation that we have in ISKCON at the moment. Now, the GBC detected that there may be a problem with their system, with the fact that when devotees come, 
the first thing they think about is let me accept the guru. So they asked the Shastric Advisory Committee to look into it. Uh, and this is what they had to say. Srila Prabhupada states that it is the responsibility of the prospective disciples to examine and test their prospective guru prior to initiation. Given that the GBC gives tacit approval to gurus via their no objection procedure, it could be that the prospective disciples' desire to examine their prospective guru prior to initiation is compromised. Although there are many glorious descriptions of the qualities of guru in Shastra, it is the duty of prospective disciples to not automatically assume those qualities are possessed by all ISKCON gurus. Rather, they should objectively examine their prospective guru. There is prima facie evidence that suggests that prospective disciples do not take this responsibility seriously. Therefore, we request the Shastric Advisory Council to research the balance between the responsibility of ISKCON to protect its members from unqualified gurus and the duty of the prospective disciples to give proper attention to the study of it. So, you know, what they're effectively saying is, yes, there is a problem, you know, that, that devotees jump into these relationships very quickly based on the fact that these spiritual masters are being presented as authorized persons. And we feel that does interfere with this, you know, in, 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 a culture, trying to initiate a culture of sadhu sangha. We do think that that creates a bit of a problem. Um, but, you know, as you say, we can't solve that problem. It, it's not really within our scope of influence, as my wife was saying. But what is in our scope of influence is to implement um, mm. a process where devotees are associating with Prabhupada deeply, discussing things nicely together as peers, using their intelligence, bringing up their doubts, raising their questions. And this sad dharma prachar can take place in Prabhu, even before you've accepted a guru. That can take place through this process of discussing Prabhupada's books. Your questions come up as a natural course. And a, do, a do guru padashrai, that can be Prabhupada, the first guru you accept. It is Prabhupada for all of us. Let's face it. What brings us to ISKCON? His books. You know, so at that point, that is that Adho Guru Parashraya, that is the acceptance of the authority right from the beginning. It's Srila Prabhupada. And then we're trying to find someone who represents him. So, you know, we're just saying, let's get that in place. Fundamentally, let devotees cultivate their intelligence, and then they choose who they like in due course of time when they're qualified to do so. Mm, yes. I think this makes... So what... Overall, you are saying is there is a problem where devotees unthinkingly choose a spiritual master. And you now I'm also part of the Shastri Advisory Council. Of course, that paper was done before I, I had joined the body. And I have read that paper. I recognize you now the you know, my understanding from what I've observed a little bit whenever I traveled is that it's a this the disciples are not really encouraged to think too much about their spiritual master, uh, about whom to choose as the spiritual master. And that is, I would say, again, the reason is not so much that the, in my practical observation, it is not so much because the GBC has appointed a particular set of gurus. It is more because a particular guru's disciples are prominent in a particular project. And they expect whoever joins that temple to, or expect whoever comes to that temple to take initiation from their spiritual master. So that is just a, that's a practical issue. So if, if a particular spiritual master's disciples are in the leaders in the management or leaders in the preaching in a particular temple, then often they are preaching, but in a sense they are preaching not just for people to come to the Krishna consciousness movement, they are also preaching to get people to come to the uh, come to their spiritual master. So I think so. That's a that is maybe something which is uh, a training is required for the preachers that you are preaching. You are preaching to uh, get people to take to Krishna consciousness, not to take initiation from your spiritual master. And that is happening. Although that that could also be a uh, that there could not be done in that direction. But what uh, Mataji you mentioned is that sadhu sangha and diksha are two separate things. And uh, if we train devotees in Sadhu Sangha, then they will, even if there is a, uh, there is a, uh, however, from wherever they get the, where they get the, they choose, however, 
they choose the spiritual master they will choose responsibly so maybe we could go to this point that uh, how what would it mean sadhu sangha that sadhu sangha is provided mm, nicely you mentioned one point is sadhu sangha is not so hierarchical it is more uh, it is more uh, more reciprocal rather than hierarchical so could you elaborate on what good sadhu sangha would mean in this context thank you for what are you addressing me prabhu yeah 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 oh, well, okay first of all thank you for your lovely question before i respond to that question would you mind if i just um just go back a little bit to um so far our conversation has been most like sadhu sangha to bring us to the point of diksha everything's about how to choose diksha and the point i made earlier that i i would prefer it's not lost completely in the ether is that that's not the only deci- uh, decision we have to make in life the whole topic of your talk of our com- conversation is how devotees need guidance why do we even take diksha because we're perplexed you know just like arjun has so many perplexities mm. shall i fight or not shall i not fight how do i deal with this problem how do i what direction what, what choices do i make in my life so we're hoping diksha will help us make those decisions but as you said earlier sometimes it's very rare to see a a guru and we, he may not be able to make those choices for every one of his disciples you know and if he does he doesn't know the situation so the real guidance we talk about is not just guidance how to take diksha that's very important but we have to do sadhu sangha so that we become intelligent enough to take guidance from shastra how to solve all the different perplexities of our lives because oftentimes when we're faced with the perplexity we're not going to have our diksha guru or our mentor or our temple president sitting next to us saying do this do that but we have to know how to make decisions based on the guidance of shastra shastra is the key thing so sadhu sangha is not just for making us intelligent enough to choose a guru sadhu sangha is for helping us become independently thoughtful shastra chakshush so that we can confidently make decisions to solve the many many different problems that we say face in life mm-hmm. i just wanted to make that it's not all about who i accept who from is how do i solve the problems of my life for that we need sadhu sangha and we need to become shastra chakshur and independently thoughtful i just wanted to make that one point before uh, i go yeah to, that, that's a good but can i capture that point i i, I, yeah. I don't want to respond i just want to make sure it's that it is emphasized that you're saying that um you know we're, we're talking about uh, sadhu sangha and developing a uh, good um shastric vision and uh, knowledge intelligence everything so that we can make a good choice of guru okay that's important but it's not everything and anyway why do we want guru you know what is it all about because we want guidance in our life because we're perplexed you know <laughs> like arjun has reached that point of perplexity he doesn't know what to do which way to turn so he's uh, they behooves one to accept the spiritual master at that point prapad says okay so um but then the spiritual master is supposed to get you out of those perplexities um and you're saying um the thing is that uh, and as chitani trampur also pointed out he may not be there uh in, to do that on the mentor may not be there or, you know in any event the mentor is not the person you have selected as your as your spiritual master necessarily so you, you don't really have someone um who can possibly always tell you what you have to do and, and we're constantly faced with important life decisions and and crises and perplexities and all kinds of things so um what 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 you're saying is that really the process of sadhu sangha is to equip us with the buddhi with the buddhi yoga with the intelligence that we can ourselves tackle these things in our life we're not constantly oh what do i do now you know trying to ask someone else and 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 get prescriptive advice we're able to actually deal with it ourselves by associating with shila prapad by you know studying and discussing especially discussing his books and in the context of that we'll find ourselves um the dami buddhi yoga so krishna gives us the intelligence by which we're able to deal with everything um that we need to and it's not just um we're struggling all the time and and we're dependent you know like the child to- constantly dependent on on the parent um you know we're we're actually able to make these decisions ourselves 
Thank you very much. Did you want to say more? Uh, I mean, there's so much, but I, I'm happy to go back to Chaitanya Charampabha's point. If, uh, I'll let he, he also yeah. made a good, uh, an interesting point about the orphan child. I don't know if we, we, we seem to have lost that one in the, in the mix. I don't know if you wanted us to talk about that, Chaitanya Shambhu, or are you, are you happy just to carry on? I'm okay. I mean, I think that we are going in a constructed direction now. We could go. Okay. Yeah. I think the, so Sadhu Sangha, you, so Sadhu Sangha is more of, you, I think you are exp, explaining how Sadhu Sangha is meant to help us uh, Meant to help, meant to help us become thoughtful. Meant to help us become, uh, become insightful enough to uh, deal with life's perplexities. So, now, is this something which is, uh, if this is this is not happening, is this something which is a, a recent phenomena in the sense that is this something which has happened in the last few dec last decade or so? Or was there a different ethos during Prabhupada's time that you observed and things change after Prabhupada disappeared? Because see, generally when we, I mean, whatever, Prabhupada, whatever accounts of Prabhupada's lives, life and uh, devotees' lives we read about, hey, and there are, of course, devotees who were leaders and they took a lot of initiative and they did adventurous things. Uh, but so was the, are you saying that there was an ethos of uh, independent thoughtfulness earlier it was lost or the other way you give the example that just as earlier there was only Buddhist vision but no Kirtan and now Kirtan is being included so it's you're saying that we as a movement have to move toward toward actualizing what is mentioned in Prabhupada's books but was actually not implemented in our movement in a significant way till now so, so you're saying um, am I suggesting that there used to be good Sadhu Sangha and we've lost it, or there was never good Sadhu Sangha and we have to bring it in? Yeah, um, something like that. Yes, yes. Oh, even, did I understand you correctly? Okay. Yes, yes, yes. Um, would you like me to say something or my husband? Since I think you brought the point, I think you can start. And of course, Krishna uh, wants to say, you can also. Obviously, I was not present when Prabhupada was physically present, but just listening to his morning walks, his conversations, reading his books, uh, his letters, and um, his memories. I think Prabhupada did it. You know, Prabhupada did a lot of Sadhu Sangha on his morning walks. He's discussing back and forth. Uh, I remember one devotee saying, I forget his name, Madhudwisa. I think it was Madhudwisa who was um, in charge of Australia. He was saying that once he was traveling with Prabhupada and Prabhupada sat in the plane with him next to him and said, okay, now let's discuss. You be the Maya body, I'll be the Vaishnav. And Mother Teresa was, uh, no, I can't. So he said, okay, I'll be the Maya body, you be the Vaishnav. Let's discuss back and forth, you know. Or whenever Prabhupada would discuss in his room conversations, he'd ask, so what do you think? What do you think? So Prabhupada was really into this culture of discussing with those who were in direct contact with him. And as far as I know, he said to those people, now you do as I do. He wanted them to also continue this culture. He said that. He says that to Sat Surabharaj, he says that in a letter to Hamsa Dutta, uh, Prabhu now, Maharaj at the time, he says that to Tribhuvana, I want you to propagate this culture of discussion from different perspectives. He says that at least three letters that I know of. And he himself did it. I think it's, you know, I mean, I'm not criticizing it. Well, I could not have done better. There were devotees at most for 10 years when time Prabhupada left. I think when Prabhupada left, it stopped and it went to ink collecting money. I mean, you can say book distribution, but I know for many years I was on so-called book distribution, and mostly the sticker distribution and collecting money, or record distribution, or hat distribution, or perfume distribution. It was really about collecting money. And ISKCON has moved on from that, and now through the efforts of, um, you know, our great book distribution generals, like by Sheshika Prabhu, it's actually books, it's not stickers. And through the input of other great devotees like Ayantra Prabhu, Sachinandan Swami, your own Guru Maharaj, uh, now we do a little bit more Harinam Kirtan as well. But I do believe that we have failed to bring back the culture that Prabhupada very much propagated, and he called it East Ghosti, of discussing mm. his books threadbare. And, and, and I feel that is to the detriment of our movement. 
and to the detriment of each individual within our movement. Because, you know, for only so long does a devotee suppress his thinking because he's, he's never been trained to think through the eyes of scripture. When he does start thinking, when he does feel dissatisfied or whatever, he starts speculating. No, when they come, when someone comes and they're still submissive and they're still like, oh, I, I would like to take your guidance. At that point, before they're dissatisfied or they've become speculated, or let's train them to think through the eyes of scripture, but to think. Let's not train people to be blind followers. Let's train people to think through the eyes of scripture. Prabhupada did it. I don't think this happened since Prabhupada has left. I'm just asking, I mean, it may have in some places, it may have been in the temples you were in, but it's not widely practiced. And I'm just, uh, I'm just suggesting that, that we bring this back as part of our main cultural aspect, the keystone to ISKCON's training when people come in, train them in good sadhu sangha. Mm. So I think this is important. And uh, wherever actually even I have traveled, whatever little, I don't want to draw on it repeatedly, but what I've seen is, at least wherever there is a good culture of education, where there are good classes, there are scriptural study courses going on, the community flourishes. Devotees are happy. The devotees are eager to go out and share Krishna Bhakti. So in one sense, it's not just necessary. It, it helps devotees individually. It helps also the community to grow. And in that sense, it, it, nourishes, the, it nourishes preaching. So... So you are saying that one way we could understand what is good sadhu sangha is that uh, after the sadhu sangha, uh, devotees would be able to take decisions wisely. Would Krishna Dharma Prabhu, would you like to resp you can respond to what Mataji has said earlier, and then you can reflect what she has said, and you can respond to this if you like. It's how so, what are the characteristics um, of good sadhu sangha basically? That would be the broad question that I have at this stage. What are the would characteristics? Good, yeah. Um, yeah, well, uh, uh, you asked first of all about um, uh, is this something which has never been implemented and should it, you know, now that it's time has come, we need to do that? Or, or was it once there and now it's lost and, um, and we need to bring it back or, or, or what, you know? And my wife was saying how, um, of course, we weren't present during Prabhupada's time, and we came uh, a little bit after that. But uh, um, from what we've seen, and what she's seen, that, you know, Srila Prabhupada very much encouraged that. He was always encouraging devotees to discuss and, to, you know, he would, on his morning walks and, and in the early days, so, you know, I was uh, quite close with Mukunda Maharaj for a while, working with him, doing service with him, and he told me how Srila Prabhupada had all the time in the world. For, for his disciples back then, you know, in the beginning, they would come, they could sit down and discuss with him as much as they like. He was completely available. Um, of course, things changed when his kong grew bigger, naturally. Um, and then um, the other leaders began to take over, and a different culture seemed to be implemented, a culture of do big, collect, you know, which is what we were inducted into when we came. There was certainly, we weren't inducted into a culture of hearing, chanting, sadhu sangha, um, you know, of associating with Prabhupada's books. In fact, you know, we can tell you anecdotes of how um, devotees were told that it was Maya <laughs> to read the books because they were supposed to be going out doing sagatan, selling, selling them, you know, <laughs> um, and, and, to, and to sort of sneak away from the street and, and read for half an hour was like, hey, what are you doing to read your Maya, you know? So, so that Reading was, was Maya. Culture. That's quite Actually, funny. yes. <laughs> Absolutely, Prabhu. I'm not joking. Um, but, you know, collecting money, and it, it, and it was all, all kinds of paraphernalia. Okay, we don't need to get into that. But now it's different. And, and she mentioned how Vaisheshika and, and other, you know, devotees have uh, managed to implement um, pure book distribution, and, and that's very nice. And, um, and their Kirtan has also been brought in as a result of um, the likes of Aindra Prabhu and others. Um, devotees have, been champ have championed that, Madhava, as we know, and, and that kind of thing. So, but still, this culture of, of thoroughly discussing the books and, and trying to understand the philosophy from different angles and so many things um, is, is missing. Um, it, 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 you know, really, we, we don't, we, but we may see that in some places. I mean, you know, it hasn't been our experience 
uh, in Christian consciousness since 1979. We've not really seen that. Um, although perhaps in, in odd places it may go on, but we're just saying make it the predominant culture of ISKCON. Um, and yes, I, I do think it's absolutely necessary, as she was saying, in order to equip devotees with the ability to practice Krishna consciousness for their whole lives. I mean, let's be honest about it. We know what the attrition rate is in ISKCON. Uh, you, you know, everyone knows that, that uh, it's, it's terrible. The percentage of devotees after five years and 10 years who still remain seriously practicing Krishna consciousness, even chanting their 16 rounds, you know, is, is, is something to be lamented over because uh, so many of them don't, you know, don't continue. They become casualties. They're out there and, and they may, you may see them for the Sunday feast or, or for the festivals, but hardly ever uh, outside of that. And they're struggling in their lives. They've now got a wife, they've got three children, they've got a job, you know, and they're just struggling. Uh, and they haven't been trained. They haven't been equipped with the tools, with the ability to solve the problems of their life on a day-to-day -day basis. And that's what we're saying. Let's do that. And, you know, Prabhupada says that householders should come together. Uh, every day they should do four things in the Bhagavad Gita, in the uh, purple 13, 8 to 12. Um, which is they chant together, they worship the deity together, they take prashan together, and they discuss books like the Bhagavad Gita and the Srimad Bhagavatam together, you know, and, and that will keep them together, and that will enable them to solve the problems of their life. But we're not training them like that. You know, we're, we're bringing them in, um, and then we're hooking them up with someone, um, and, and perhaps with a mentor structure, uh, and then, you know, that when that falls apart for them or when, when they get into a position where they're, you know, unable really to deal, to, to carry on with that, um, they're floundering. They're back where they were when they first walked through the temple door, perplexed. Mm. So, yeah, we're just saying let's try and address that problem right from the start. Yeah. So would this mean, say, regarding the culture of, thank you for your points, the, the culture of, say, Sadhu Sangha, say, we, as, even as compared to, say, 10 years ago or 15 years ago, there is a significant emphasis on education now, where devotees are being uh, encouraged or even required to take a Bhakti Shastri course. And uh, there are many spiritual masters who don't give second initiation unless, uh, unless the devotee has completed Bhakti Shastri. So it does seem that education is being emphasized, but I, I surmise that uh, what you, when you're talking about Sadhu Sangha, it's, it's more than education. Uh, so that's what I'm trying to understand. Uh, what yes, it is more than yeah, education. So if, if you, so you sorry explain. to interrupt you. Yeah, so just, yeah, go ahead, please. It's so nice you bring this in. Thank you. Thank you for bringing this up. You know, I, I'm so happy they do things like back to Shastri. Please don't think we're trying to knock that but it's an academic approach. You know, you, there's preset questions. You read the books to find the answers to that questions. You learn the verses to memorize so you can pass the test. What Saru Sangha is, is a daily part of our lives. Coming together without preset questions, Prabhupada, Prabhupada says how to do it. He says, do it systematically. Start from the beginning of the Gita. It's not about how many books you learn or even how many shlokas you learn or whether you're good at writing essays, whether you're good at passing exams, it's not about that. It's about coming together, two people or more, two or three people, your family members, your friends, your, your mentor, your mentee, coming together and churning, churning Prabhupada's books and letting the questions come from you, not having the questions preset. So as you're discussing, it's thinking, what don't I understand? What isn't making sense to me? What do I understand? There's several habits that Papa says. First of all, he says, repeat what he is telling us in our own words. He says, don't be just like a parrot. Capture my meaning and put it in your own words. There's so many places he says that. He says, even for material things, you have to repeat in order to learn. So we, we say, come and don't just repeat Papa's own words. Read the sentence, read the passage. Put it in your own words, because when you have to put it in your own words, you first have to think. There's Shrotavya, then there's Deyaya, thinking about it. What does he mean? What does he mean? Then there's Tritavya's chap. 
Then you have to put it in your own words. You express it. So immediately there's that thinking process. And then you let the questions come from within you. What does it make sense to me? How does this apply to me? And it's not an academic exercise we do for as long as we got the, until we pass the exam. It's a habit that we put into our lives daily. We come together for half an hour, 20 minutes a day together, or two or three times a week together, whatever is your timetable allows. Preferably, I would say, twice a day, morning and evening, Prabhupada's is gone sandwich, half an hour morning, half an hour evening, and discuss, you know, ch- thread pair, sentence by sentence, passage by s- passage. So it's not, it's not, it's not resulting in, in, in an end exam, and that's it. You've done your back to Shastri. This is an ongoing habit and practice. Sadhu Sangha should never stop. Sadhu Sangha, we do it daily, associate with Prabhupada. That, do I understand him correctly? What do I understand him to me? What are my doubts? What are my confusions? What does it make sense to me? Doesn't it make sense to me? If it does make sense to, it, to me, how can this help me in my life? How can I bring this knowledge that I've just received today from Prabhupada Sangha and to solve the problems that I'm dealing with in my life? You know, this is the crucial habit that changed the trajectory of our lives, my husband and myself. And the few devotees that we've managed to share it with, they've all felt this, it helps them. And we would just like to see this becoming a, a, a habit that every devotee is trained in, how to do daily sadhu sangha. By all means, those who are intellectual, go on and pass the exams. But this sort of sangha is even for the non-intellectuals. It's for anybody. Anybody can come together and discuss at their level, what is Prabhupada saying to me? How would I put that in my own words? What do I understand? How can it help me? What are my doubts? What are my confusions? You know, so this is a daily habit. It's not a an exam, it's not a matriculation exam or something. That also has a wonderful place in our society. We're not knocking it, but it's not an ongoing habit. And we would like to devotees to be trained in a culture that's like chanting 16 rounds is an ongoing habit. It's not that we chant 64 rounds one day to pass an exam. Okay, you've got your chanting exam. No, we do it 16 rounds every day. So similarly, Sadhu Sangha every day. So we get Krishna's protection and Krishna giving us the intelligence to solve the different perpetu- uh, uh, perplexities of our lives. That's beautiful. So, yeah, that's, I think the Bhakti Shastri, it's almost like, uh, okay, now I completed the degree, now it's done. But in one sense, Shravanam and Dhyanam, uh, as you said, Shrotavya Dhyasya Pujata, so that that is something which has to be done daily. So that Sangha is beautiful. That's, so I would like to ask something about this. But before that, Krishna Dharma you want to reflect something on what Mataji has said? Uh, yeah, of course, yeah. Um, so yeah, you were asking, um, you were saying, of course, in ISKCON we have Bhakti Shastri, Bhakti Vaibhava, etc., um, so is that not uh, something, you know, that we approve, that we like, that we think is, you know, the Sadhu Sangha process? Um, and uh, is there a distinction, you know, between what we're saying? You sense that there is a distinction. And my wife pointed out, yes, there is, that um, what we're saying is um, we're asking that there be a daily process of um, associating with Prabhupada's books and, and bringing up our own questions because the the nature of Bhakti Shastri and we know exactly what it is. Our daughter actually went to Mayapur and, and spent six months there and took the Bhakti Shastri course and the exam at the end. She's passed it and everything, you know. So we know, we know what it's about. Um, and it's it's really about that there are certain questions that, you know, are brought up and you have to um, study Shastra in order to be able to answer those questions. But it's not about really exploring your own um, questions, your own doubts, your own confusions, the very things that will make you give up the path at some point or become bewildered at some point if you don't deal with them. Um, and, you know, so we're saying the Sadhu Sangha is where you churn Prabhupada's books, where you actually uh, bring out your own questions by associating with him. That's what happens. 
when you do that, this is a, a part of a, um, you know, you, you just quoted the Sanskrit, but she also quoted Shrotavyakaya and, you know, the, the Kirta, Kirta, uh, uh, hearing and assimilating and repeating. <laughs> in English, <laughs> I like English. <laughs> so the, yeah, so that is what we're saying, um, and it, it, and it's not um, it's not a jnani process. It's not something about learning and assimilating knowledge. This is this is part of the process of the nine angas of bhakti, shravanam kirtanam. That you know we're we're saying needs to be there. It needs to be regular shravanam and kirtanam. And in the process of discussing of sadhu sangha, we do those things. Um, and then we naturally, uh, you know, come to the point of contemplating by repeating back, by, you know, really trying to deeply understand it. Um, we, we contemplate it and then we, we you know, we, we apply the knowledge. We, we bring out the questions that we have. We try to answer those and then we get to the point of applying it practically in our lives to solve the problems of our life. So that, that, mm. that's really what she was trying to say there. Yes. Yeah, so right. yeah, so uh, thank you, thank you, thank you. So now you're talking about the sandwich of morning and evening. When our movement was temple based, there is the Bhagavatam class in the morning and the Bhagavata class in the evening. And uh, now we are mostly we have become a congregation based movement, so everybody is stay at different places. They may not be able to come to the temples also. But even then, so what you are discussing, or what you are suggesting. If, if even the Bhakti Shastri is, uh, at least Bhakti Shastri to some extent, there is some kind of accountability in the sense you have to give an exam, some kind of interaction, some exercises are there. If you consider our daily Bhagavatam classes, they are quite didactic and unidirectional. So if I understand right, when you're talking about Sadhu Sangha, you're not really referring to just classes, you're referring to discussions. Mm, am I right in understanding that? Or... Yes. So then did Prabhupada, of course, Prabhupada's morning walks are examples of uh, Prabhupada doing this discussion and uh, even playing the devil's advocate at times and forcing devotees to uh, defend uh, their beliefs and their understandings. Uh, so now Prabhupada did that. So, but it seems that Prabhupada said that Prabhupada did he, when he, when he said Nityam Bhagavata Seva means daily attendance at the Bhagavatam classes, that's how Prabhupada translated it. So is it that maybe at that time, are you saying that the movement was new, so the Bhagavatam classes were more didactic and now they should be more conversation based? Or are you referring to something apart from the Bhagavatam classes? There are other forums for uh, Sadhu Sangha where it is more of a reciprocal which leads to, which leads to more uh, Independent, thoughtful thinking. Yeah, should I respond? Yes, I'm either of you. Yeah, yeah, please. Go okay, ahead. Well, I'll start. Uh, my wife can come after. Um, and yeah, you're saying, um, are we like uh, you know, niche and Bhagavata Seva? You're saying that the ISKCON sandwich consists of um, the, the morning Bhagavatam class, the evening Gita class. Although the evening Gita class is uh, <laughs> uh, not not so well attended, you might say, and uh, devotees are perhaps here, there, and everywhere, and they're not able to come together for that. Um, but it, it it was, you know, the thing that Prabhupada implemented initially, the ISKCON sandwich, so the morning class and the evening class. Um, and you're saying that it was that you know didactic thing that the uh, speaker Prabhupada would deliver the class and everyone would sit there and hear. Um, and uh, uh, and the evening class similarly. And now, are we suggesting that that should change and that, that we should have a more conversational type of class and discussion type of thing? Or are we saying that, no, the classes are fine, keep them, but let's add, add uh, as well as the class, this discussion um, process, this ishta ghosti, as my wife was saying, which Prabhupada actually meant to be a philosophical discussion and not talking about who's going to clean the toilets and that kind of thing. But uh, yeah, that's um, so. Are we saying that 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 should come in addition to the classes, or or do we think the classes themselves need to change, right? Hmm. Yeah. I, 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 in response, um, we, you know, we, we spoke to one Prabhupada, a lady actually, who told us that in the early days, very early days of the classes, they used to all come with the book 
Um, and, you know, the class they would get, uh, you know, the first they were discussing, they would each of them read the purport and, and actually have some kind of discussion uh, take place during the time of the class where they would, um, you know, each get a chance to, to think about it and, and to say something. And it wasn't just one person sitting there and, and speaking. Um, of course, Prabhupada did that, but he's like, of course, he's the professor. You know, if you're in the university, the professor gives a lecture. But then what do the students do? You know, they, they sit down and discuss what the professor has said. Uh, that You know, there may be tutors uh, 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 sort of helping, but it's all about trying to understand, analyze the professor's lecture. So, you know, we feel the classes should be like that. And th one of the problems with, you know, that we see with classes is that it's passive hearing. Passive means you just sit there and the person speaks and it goes in one ear and out the other. And often they're on their phone, they're, they're nodding off, they're thinking about prashadam, they're, you know, they're distracted or they're just not there at all. Uh, how many people actually come to the class, even online? How many people? You know, hardly anyone. Percentage-wise of, of the community, like in the Bhaktivedanta Manor community of thousands, you might see, you know, 50 people listening to the class and 10, 12, 15 in the temple room, hardly any. But even then, the, the ones that are, 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 you know, they'll come out of the class at the end and, oh, brilliant class. And he said, yeah, well, what, what, did, what did you understand? What were the key points? Oh, I can't really remember. <laughs> you know, maybe one point, if they're lucky, something like that. So it's not really very powerful and effective. Uh, and, and we try to give classes in a different way where we get more involvement um, from from the audience, and, and it can be done, and devotees can be trained how to do that. You know, to to have like a, a PowerPoint, put up the purport on on the board, uh, and then just go through it and, and and understand. Like you know, you, you can have a class. Say someone gave a class on one 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 from the Bhagavatam. It's an eight page purport, and in one day they give the class. You know, <laughs> excuse me. You know, mm. we need to go through that. That, that purport is full of diamonds you know um, and we're just going to skim over that and there's so many like that that we just it, it would give the class and they don't even speak from the purple they go off on a tangent you know the, the, so many things and uh, you know so so we say okay let's go through it systematically stick the purple up and get everyone to get involved you can give your understanding and others can get involved um you know and it becomes more of an effective forum for assimilating for doing these three things of hearing, assimilating, and then repeating, and, you know, it, it'll, it'll be more effective. So we would like to see classes changed, yes, definitely. But as well as that, we'd like to see more discussions take place, not just that morning class. Um, evening, at least that, at least the morning and the evening. As you say, the evening's dropped out of the picture. But at least those two things we'd like to see done in an effective way. That's true. You know, regarding uh, one challenge with respect to this ch uh, churning or sadhu sangha is with respect to the current classes, as you said, it's too didactic, it's too passive. But another challenge is that there are maybe too many people over there in the sense, not too many in terms of number, but too many levels. So it's, it's almost like the Bhagavatam classes, say if you compare it to university, it's, uh, it's a university in which... Uh, say, a uh, second standard student and a PhD student are expected to attend, both attend the same class. And that's what they're expected to do for the rest of their life. So it's natural that a lot of devotees, uh, so if you try to adjust the PhD level standard students, PhD level students need, the second standard student will feel cut off. And if you address the second standard student needs, the PhD level student will be cut off. So, like last time, I think we discussed about Sajatiya. So, I think that is also a challenge when we are having, a, we are trying to discuss, there has to be some level of uh, compatibility in terms of understandings. It's, it's say, suppose somebody is giving a class on maybe how Bhishma has gloriously departed from the world. And at that time, somebody starts asking a question, you know, how do, what is this, what is the scientific proof for the existence of the soul? Now that would be, it's an important question, but that would be a complete mismatch over there. So 
it seems that sadhu sangha also will need to be more you could say that decentralized or customized according to the needs of the particular group of devotees who are coming together any thoughts about this mata mata ji would like to answer or yes um so i'm happy to go back as far as you like i just want to make sure our discussion is connected um yep. you initially asking you were initially asking um are we saying uh the the nature of the, the classes have to change or as well as the classes we have to add extra discussions and my husband was saying well both but first of all let's get the discuss let's get the classes functioning the way they should be functioning let's get people actually learning and participating and doing shravanam and jaya and kirtavyascha and not just falling asleep or just spacing out let's get the classes improved and then you raised a, an interesting point developing that uh, chaitanya charan prabhu you're saying that yeah you see the need for improving classes and one of the things about classes is that one class in the morning is meant to um catch newcomers beginners and the devotees have been studying prakrit books for many years all in one 45 minutes and that's like putting you know high school students you know ba students you know master students and phd students all in the same classroom and say do the, you know you're going to learn science together it's like if you if you um aim it at the high school students the phd students and the and the and the master students just going to go this isn't meant for me and if you aim it at the phd and at the uh students the high school students and the um the, you know the, the new university students are going to feel this isn't meant for me so but that's what we're doing we just put everyone in the same class and, uh, and then you gave an example of the kind of questions that maybe a phd student would ask which would be would be completely irrelevant for a, a newcomer so you're saying what are our thoughts on that did i have i kept yeah, the thread perfect, correctly perfect, perfect. perfect yes thank you for retracing the thought <laughs> thank you too you know um my response to you prabhu is that um we have improved in every area we've improved the way we do rath yatra for when prabhu was here when prabhu was here he did rath yatra on a you know he did rath yatra one way in his very first rath yatra since then devotees have improved it you know we've improved the way festivals are given we've improved the way food for life is done we've done we've improved the way um uh book distribution is done you know we've improved the way kirtan festivals are done the one thing which we think it was done like this when prabhu was here we're going to keep doing it like this is the geet morning bhagavat time and the evening geet class and they've become irrelevant and the geet class hardly anyone goes to even temple to very least here um and certainly no one does it when they become householders my husband and myself do at home but it's very rare um So the one thing which we think no we can only do it the way it happened when Prabhu was here is is Bhagavatam class and Gita class which are probably the most important foundational parts of our sadhana that association with Bhagavatam and Gita is like the fuel is the engine of our spiritual progress it fuels our spiritual progress and that's the one thing that we're not going to improve we're just going to keep it the way it was you know uh, so i like your points I, i i don't think we have the answers to everything mm. but our first thing is even the newcomers who come train them first train them in how to do sadhana sangha one thing i observe in class is people ask irrelevant questions you know the the top proper we have 16 principles of good sadhana sangha all of which are collated from proper instructions so when people would ask as topic a question when proper was speaking on a on a peripheral point proper would say why are you asking that question that's not on the main point so training people in the culture of good sadhana sangha includes training them in how to ask correct questions you know and how to reflect back without speculating and how to contribute without speculating you know so at least give everyone the high school students the phd students everyone the basic training in how to participate in discussions in spiritual circles not speculating not 
and speaking pleasantly and keeping it on topic, keeping it to the point. And then if there can be further improvements, like the improvements you're uh, suggesting, I would think, yes, no, obviously, we haven't thought that far ahead. I think that would be the prerogative of individual temples. But our basic point is first train everyone in how to keep it to the point on the topic that Prabhupada is speaking about in that purport, keep it on that topic and ask questions which help us to understand the topic he is discussing and not to use our questions or our comments to sabotage and take us away from the point Prabhupada is trying to instruct us on. Give that basic training and that basic habit to everybody. And obviously, over and above that, there may be many ways that we can make our Bhagavatam and Gita discussions more effective. That's one thing I'd like to say. I would just like to add. I do think there's also a point for including Easter ghosties as well as class. Prabhupada said, now I want you to increase. So the minimum was Bhagavatam and Gita discussion. We don't even keep the minimum anymore, but that's the minimum. And then he said, I want you to increase. And that is to add a Easter ghosty. Easter ghosty is small groups because depending on the temple, depending how many people are there, the shyest, the quietest will be left out. They will not do any jaya or kirtavascha. But in small Easter ghosties, everyone is a given a chance to participate. And that's all a matter of organization. Maybe we'll have the class and then an Easter ghost later on to discuss the class. So many, I mean, we don't, we're not trying to say we have the answers for everything and there's a lot of room for uh, different ideas coming into how we can improve the hearing process. We just want to get the principle that hearing and understanding Prabhupada's books is essential for our individual success and our movement success. And um, I would like to add one last point. I'm really sorry, it's just, I worry that it may, uh, there's one lecture by Prabhupada where Prabhupada said, you know, the Bhagavatam class should not just be a matter of routine. He said it should be a routine, but not just a matter of routine. You should be learning. You must learn something. That is our principle. The learning, the assimilation, the transformation must be happening. That And devotees must be trained and facilitated and supported in that engagement and connection with Prabhupada's books actually happening. That's all I wanted to say. Okay. Yeah, I mean, I agree that, you know, this is, our moment is very big and even if we don't have all the answers, I don't think anybody has all the answers as such, but at least we can take steps in those directions. Yes. And uh, also some, some sustained discussion on the themes that Prabhupada teaches are important. Now, just one question about this. Uh, uh, Vishindarama Prabhu, you want to reflect something or uh, should I? Um, yeah. Please yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. I'll, I'll, I'll get yeah. it in a minute. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, and I have talked with different devotees about uh, the Bhagavatam classes. And uh, see, there is the verse and there is the purport. So, now the tangential class can go tangential in many different ways. Tangential means it just becomes, say, some kind of entertainment with nothing to do with either the verse or the purport. Hmm? Another is that it, it will be go sentence by sentence on the purport and then maybe explain that. Hmm? At the same time, it, so this could be, we could say, too, I don't want to use the word extreme for either approach, but too broad, uh, broad frames within which things could work. Now, every devotee is an individual. So, if some devotee feels inspired to speak on the verse and they take some points on the purport, but they talk broader about, broadly about the pastime and the stress is not on the purport, but it is on the verse. And it is on the, the pastime, which is a part of the verse, the analysis that is a part of the verse. So I would, my understanding is Prabhupada, Prabhupada wanted the purports to be aids in studying the scriptures. So, and now it is... Uh, the purport and scripture both go together. At the same time, you know, Prabhupada wanted us to study the scripture. And if devotees based on, say like even you have written your Bhagavatam, where you draw from previous Acharya's commentaries, and then you elaborate. So 
so is it uh, isn't there some room for again go we can go back to independent thoughtfulness that independent thoughtfulness means individuality so different devotees will take different approaches to giving the bhagavatam class or explaining do we does everybody have to have that approach that every single sentence in the purport has to be explained in your class or it's tangential as long as they're discussing the whole past discussing the past time discussing the words they are focusing on the uh, on the theme that is given in the scripture in that place uh, my understanding would be that is still bhagavat katha it is not tangential so of course i know that different devotees have different opinions about this but i i, I do find agree what is tangential is if nothing about the verse or about the purport but sometimes the verse can inspire different devotees in different ways and prabhupad said that you know he wanted to write another commentary on the bhagavad gita if if he had the time so that means the verse is it that the verse can speak to a devotee today only through the purport can the verse of course we read the purport but the verse can speak to a devotee uh, in a way that uh, may at certain times be slightly different from what is said in the purport and as long as the devotee is speaking on the verse speaking on the scripture so is that a this is I, i don't see that as disrespect to shri prabhupad i see that as the mercy of shri prabhupad that a devotee is able to to elaborate on the elaborate on the scripture and give us a deeper understanding of the scripture okay. um yeah I'll, i'll stop you're saying um i i i i don't know if you can tell me wanted me to uh, uh, capture the um no no it's okay please carry on okay <laughs> yeah um anyway i mean that you know you you're stressing the importance of keeping it to prabhupada's purport um you know make keeping it on point questions relating to prabhupada what he's saying you know and not going off on a tangent and so many things um and and also introducing us to ghosty so those that but now chetan trumper is saying uh, well when it comes to the class does it always have to be that we're going through you know line by line on the purport or um you know can it be that um someone because the purport after all is expanding the meaning of the verse that's the whole point the purport of the verse is what prabhupada is giving us so um some devotees you know take the approach of like and trying to explain for them the, the, themselves uh, what they understand from the purport from the verse um and th- they may you know speak back about katal they may not go off he chaitanya of temporary recognizes there is a problem sometimes where devotees go off on a tangent where they you know give us their life story or <laughs> start telling jokes or just trying to entertain everyone and so many things but um but not always sometimes they they stick to the, you know, they talk about the verse and they and they you know give their own understanding their own realizations etc so does that have to be a problem um uh, he's you're saying is that right prabhuji yes yes definitely okay um yeah i, I mean i i would like to say a couple of things one is that um what are we trying to achieve you know we're saying right from the start here that um prabhupad is the fundamental foundational authority in iskon uh, and we need to form a relationship with him and you know establish him as the as the principal shiksha guru and it, you know it, it's not just um a, a sentiment uh, he himself says in his books that one should take this is i'm going to quote you now from the fourth canto 2222 purple one should take shelter of a pure devotee who has nothing to do with this material world but is simply engaged in devotional service by serving him only can one transcend the qualitative material condition in this verse it is recommended that one serve the lotus feet of the topmost yogi or the devotee to serve the topmost devotee means to hear from him about the glories of the supreme personality of godhead and you know we can give there are so many statements from prabhupad where he stresses the importance of associating with the top most devotee hearing from the top most devotee that is our process that is how we are as he put it in this particular verse tra- how we can transcend the qualitative material condition by serving him only we can't do that by serving a conditioned soul by hearing from a conditioned soul you know it I mean, with all due respect to the devotees who give classes, I know I give class. I know I'm a conditioned soul. Now, what value 
Uh, is it my three minute lecture going to give them, you know, a 30 minute or 45 minute lecture going to do for anyone? You know, I, I can't get myself out of this ocean of misery. I'm struggling to get out my, you know, how am I going to lift anyone else out? But if I can somehow act as the higher media for them to associate with the pure devotee, with Prabhupada, to hear from him, I can actually do them some good. You know, and we can do that because we've got there, there's his purports. Pur the purports are not just explaining the verses, they're Prabhupada's ecstasies. They're him. They're, they're, the Vani and the, and the spiritual master are non different. So we can associate with the topmost devotee by hearing from him. But in, in the, and we should do that in the class. And the problem is, you know, devotees may want to speak their realizations. That's fantastic. But do it outside of the Bhagavatam class, please. Because the Bhagavatam class is our, sometimes the sole opportunity that anyone may have to actually associate with Prabhupada in their day. You know, they, they, they may tune into the Bhagavatam class um, in the morning and then go to work. They've got no more time. They come home at night and you have so many things going on. So the one opportunity they actually have to get the association of the topmost devotee and hear from him, they end up hearing from a conditioned soul. You know, all growth to the Prabhu, he's giving his realizations, wonderful. But is it the same as actually hearing from Prabhupada? Is he a liberated soul? You know, can he get us out of the qualitative modes of nature and, and help us to transcend? Or, you know, Prabhupada can do that. And we have the opportunity to associate with him mm. right there in the class. So let's not lose that opportunity. You know, and, and let's not usurp that ourselves with our own <laughs> our thoughts, ideas, and whatever it may be. You know, that's okay if you want to do that. But do that outside of the class. And if anyone wants to hear you, that's up to them. Okay. Yes, Mother, do you want to add something to this or reflect on it? Uh, it's my practice to always pick up from the key points. So if I may just first do that. Um, thank you, Swami. So you're saying, well, if we give class in the verse and, and kind of like, uh, surpass, surpass Prabhupada and say, well, we're not going to talk about what Prabhupada says, we're going to talk about what I've got to say about this. We are cheating people who come, who tuned in or come to that Bhagavatam class of the opportunity to hear from and serve the topmost devotee, which is the only means of transcending the qualitative modes of material nature. So in a sense, we're not doing anyone any service. By all means, we can be intelligent and talk about the verse, but let's not usurp the Bhagavatam class, which is maybe the only opportunity some devotees have to actually associate and take Prabhupada's Sangha. So let's not usurp that. So if that was my husband's point, um, which I deeply appreciate and uh, I'm not contradicting, I would just like to add something to that, if I may, that yes. there are devotees, and I, I mean, I'm not one of them, but there are devotees who are truly learned and uh, also know the... Uh, the um, teachings of the Acharyas. I, I know one of your god brothers here in the UK. I think he's a, an incredible asset to ISKCON and his friendship and is a great asset in our personal lives um, because he knows he studied in Sanskrit all the teachings of all the Acharyas. He knows the books back and front. He knows. So I'd love to hear him um, explaining some other lights on a verse from other acharyas, you know, that'd be great. But then we have to change our approach to Bhagavatam class. That it's not that one verse per class. If a devotee is going to speak on the verse because that particular devotee is truly learned, he's not speculative and just wasting everyone's time, but he's going to tell us what Rupa Goswami says on this verse, what Jiva Goswami says on this verse. So, great. But let's spend more than one session on that class so that the next day we can then hear what Prabhupada has to say on that verse. You know what I mean? So I would, I mean, that's what we do at home. We actually do spend a session because we go through systematically and scrutinizingly. So one day we may just be on the verse and we're just trying to analyze the verse. But the next day we will go to Prabhupada's purport and we'll hear what Prabhupada has got to say on that verse. So if we're going to bring in other acharyas to expand on verses, fine. As long as we change our 
a policy about class. It's going to be one verse per class. My husband made a really nice point. Janma Jessia has got, like, it's an eight-page report. One class for that? You've got to be kidding me. You know, <laughs> that should be, we should be spending on that for each per- verse for the verse and then for each paragraph, you know. So let's actually make our Bhagavatam classes more than just a ritual that we do unthinkingly, and let's make them a thoughtful opportunities and, and effective opportunities for devotees to deeply assimilate and understand Prabhupada's teachings. So that's the only thing I wanted to add. Mm. I think this is a... Um, I would say that at the very least, a lot of... Uh, options have become clear for what devotees could do at an individual and collective level to move forward and get sadhu sangha. So, any any we are always there for two hours. I don't. I want to respect your time. Also, not take too much of your time. Are there any concluding points you would like to make before, uh, or anything about sadhu sangha specifically, or? You want to share uh, any, any points as such, or I can summarize. How do you want to go ahead? Would you mind if I emphasize one point before you did your yeah, summary? Um, sure. We had one last discussion too, and um, when you asked that question, I said, I'm fine, and I wish I'd emphasize this point. Um, at least in three places I know of, um, two of them come straight to my mind, Canto 3, Chapter 3, Text 6, and Canto 11, Chapter 3, Text 30. Uh, and there is one other place I just can't remember the reference. Um, Prabhupada emphasized the importance of being trained, of learning how to do Sadhu Sangha. And where do we take that training from? He says, we get that from the pure devotee. These are some things that Prabhupada says about how to associate with him and how to get the most of out, out of it. And he says, we need training in that. We need, it's one thing to know it, it's another thing to be, make it part of our habit. And my greatest hope, uh, though I'm a nobody, I'm a nobody in ISKCON or in the figure of things, but my greatest hope is for the benefit of our movement and for the benefit of our individuals within the movement, we begin looking at training, not based on our our viewpoints, but based on what Prabhupada is saying. Um, We've done the best we can to share Prabhupada's instructions and how we've applied them on our website, improvingsangha.com. If that isn't good enough, please, you collate Prabhupada's instructions and start training programs for devotees to learn how to do Sadhu Sangha properly. And if it's being done properly, there is a um, pH test, a litmus test. We can tell if our training is being effective. And the pH test is given in scripture itself, 11330. If we're doing Sadhu Sangha correctly, these are the things we should be experiencing. Our mutual loving friendships are developing. We're experiencing mutual happiness and satisfaction. And we're becoming increasingly attached to the process of hearing chanting and detached from sense gratification. So let's implement a this training, and that's what devotees are inducted into, into training for good sadhu sangha, and this, that small group groups are facilitated for them to practice good sadhu sangha, so, and that becomes the very basis of their of their, their foundation for their continued growth in their spiritual life. That's the only thing I want to add. Thank you very much. Mm, that's wonderful, and thank you. I think Falena Parichete, as, as our Acharya as Prabhupada also says, it's written in the fruit. Thank you. So, Krishna Prabhu, you want to add something? No, I would have said the same thing. That, that you know, um, that training is, is actually required in, in the principles of Sadhu Sangha. And, and Sri Prabhupada has indeed uh, given us many instructions in that regard. And, and we have collated those um, on the website improvingsangha.com. Um, and we invite you to please take a look and see what you think um, and contact us. Uh, and, you know, if you'd like further help and, and guidance in, in those principles, because um, we found them very effective and they're, 
directly taken from from the books. We, you know, cite all the evidences from Srila Prabhupada and uh yeah. <laughs> Please have a look. Thank you. So I'll try to summarize. So mm -hmm. Uh, overall, today we try to discuss the topic of, you know, how can devotees get the guidance and the wisdom to to move ahead in their spiritual lives, to grow spiritually, to face life's perplexities at large. So one aspect we started by discussing is how there is uh, devotees need to be right from the beginning connected with Shri Prabhupada's books, by which they can learn to start thinking and then they can thoughtfully select their spiritual master, even whether they have unlimited choice or limited choice, but they'll be able to choose judiciously. And then they will also be able to deal with the, it's not just initiation, but it's also various challenges that they face in spiritual life, in practical life. They should get Shastra Chakshuta, see with the eyes of scripture. And for that, what is important for such training is that we, you started by reading what, how Prabhupada is our preeminent Shiksha Guru. And that needs to be, that needs to be actualized in the life of devotees through a regular culture of hearing from Srila Prabhupada in association. So that's why Sadhu Sangha is more about devotees coming together and not in a hierarchical or didactic mood, but in an active reciprocal mood discussing. And by this, everybody can, can develop their personal relationship with Prabhupada. And then that it's almost like we get, we get an inner compass to make decisions. Otherwise, we get more and more dependent on, on others. And so we are a living tradition. At the same time, to be a part of the living tradition in an intelligent way, we need guidance. And that guidance comes from the regular study of Prabhupada's books. And then we discussed how, say... <clears throat> our movement is in many ways moving in a healthy direction. Earlier, Kirtan was not being done so much on the book distribution, but now Kirtan is also happening. So similarly, we are moving towards, uh, we, we can move towards Sadhu Sangha more and more. So the education is good. But at the same time, education makes, education like Bhakti Shastri courses, it makes it quite target oriented. And uh, it is a little bit more pre-formatted. Whereas we wanted things are much more systematic, uh, much more, a much more a part of a regular schedule. Just like we chant every day. Similarly, we hear every day. We, it, and not just we hear, but actually we have Sadhu Sangha. That means, so it can be devotees form small groups. So the, with the devotees moving out of, most devotees out of the temple, the, the traditional ISKCON sandwich of Bhagavatam and Bhagavad Gita class really may not be practical for most devotees. But then there can be Ishta Goshti among small groups of devotees who can come together and then they can discuss and we go over what Srila Prabhupada is saying systematically and Prabhupada has given us so much in his books and his purports. And we need, uh, so we also discussed about how the Bhagavatam class keeps us connected with the Bhagavatam, but still there, there are many things which could be done to, to make the Bhagavatam classes more effective. And uh, rather than say giving definitive answers, you know, we are basically like, um, because you're throwing the flashlight or casting a light on what are the needs and how the process of Sadhu Sangha can help us address those needs. The specifics of how the Sadhu Sangha will work in different situations, that is something can, which can be addressed. And of course, you had a lot of Prabhupada quotes throughout to illustrate the points of how Prabhupada wanted us to, Prabhupada trained devotees in thoughtfulness by having mock debates and playing devil's advocates. And even during the Bhagavatam classes, after the Bhagavatam classes, devotees would come together and discuss. So this has been a this has been a part of our tradition, but it has sort of not been adequately emphasized. So when we do that, then the result of Sadhu Sangha, the result of center discussion centered on Krishna would be that we feel enriched, we feel content, and we feel enlivened in our spiritual life. So you have create you have provided some guideline guidelines on improvingsangha.com and those are also available for devotees who would like to develop, explore and develop the subject more. And we discussed many more points, Perfect. but if you would like to add anything more, please, any concluding words? 
That was perfect. <laughs> very nice recap. Thank you so much, Prabhu. Thank, Thank you, Prabhu. I very much appreciate your kind support. Thank you, Krishna Guru. Thank you, Chitani Mataji, for sparing your time and joining today. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Thank you for your time. Thank you.